ഓമ ജ്ഞാന ചിമിരൻ ഭസ്യ A festival such as the festival we are presently taking part in encapsulates the essence of Vaishnav culture. The essence of Vaishnav culture is for devotees to come together and glorify the Lord, especially in Kirtan. So this is the acne and the essence of Vaishnav culture. However, there are many other activities in life this is the most important activity in life and in Vaishnav culture is to chant Hare Krishna and the association of devotees and of course there are many other activities in life beginning with rising in the morning of course some people rise in the afternoon in Vaishnav culture we rise in the morning and uh, going to the bathroom and brushing our teeth and all these kinds of things Now, the uh, influence of culture is so all-pervading that it even influences these things. Just to give a very uh, graphic example, passing stool. In uh, most countries of the world, or originally, people squatted to do so. That is more effective for expelling the waste matter. It's, it, it's the natural position for the body to do so. But in the Western countries, they discovered it's more comfortable... to sit suspended in mid-air while you do that, as if you are sitting in an armchair or something. And in uh, civilized culture, after passing stool, one takes back. But in the modern life, they're too busy, they have to rush off and watch a Tom and Jerry cartoon or something very important. So they just wipe their, they smear their backside with some paper, and then walk out and that's it. They might wash their hands. So I'm just giving this example to show that the influence of culture extends to every feature of life, even to passing stone. Culture influences what we do, how we do it, our attitudes to life, the way we deal with, with others, the way we think. So we can understand how important culture is for devotees. Because the whole purpose of Krishna consciousness is always to think of Krishna favorably and to serve him. Smartavya satatam vishno vismartavya vismartavya najatuja sarva vidhi nishedasya etayo eva kinkaraha One should always think of Vishnu and never forget it. All the rules and regulations in the scriptures are the servant of these two regulations to always think of Krishna and never forget it. So culture affects our attitudes and the way we think. So in Krishna consciousness we are cultivating Krishna consciousness What for? So that we can think of Krishna. And we accept a certain way of life because it will help us to think of Krishna. Why do we rise early in the morning? Because that's the best time to chant Hare Krishna. Why do we chant Hare Krishna? Because that's pleasing to Krishna. So we have a... In a anyone who takes to Krishna consciousness, especially coming from the Western countries, their life changes radically. All of us, uh, we were not brought up in a culture in which we wear uh, what are considered to be Indian clothes. We didn't, we weren't taught as children, except the children who are here, to put on tila. We weren't, in our childhood, we weren't uh, taught to go out in the streets and sing and dance, or to chant Sanskrit verses. All, the, in, in other words, we have accepted a different culture, a different way of life. Sometimes people complain about that, that we are Russians, you should follow the Russian way, don't follow something else. They become upset. So, actually it's a fact that by taking up Krishna conscious, we have taken up a new kind of culture by which we're not acting as Russians, we're acting as spirit soul servants of Krishna, the Supreme Personality of God. So, the more we take up this culture, the more it helps us to be fixed in the understanding of that I am the eternal servant of Krishna. And the more we take up this culture, the more it helps us to please Krishna and come close to Krishna. Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He is absolute, that means he's independent. He's not under anyone's control. He can do whatever he likes. If Krishna wants, he can throw away his flute and pick up a saxophone. If Krishna wants, he can, instead of wearing a dhoti, he can wear tight blue jeans. And if he wants, he can you know, have a... punk hairstyle with green, red and blue hair. But Krishna doesn't do these things. 
He is Gopal. He is a cowherd boy. And he likes to play on a flute. And he likes to dress in what we would call Indian style dress. And he loves music, but not rock music. He loves derivatives. And he likes what we would call Indian food, but it's actually Krishna style of food. So this is what Krishna likes to do. And we are part and parcel of Krishna. So if we want to please Krishna, we should do what Krishna, live in a way that Krishna likes to live. And actually that will be pleasing to us because we are part and parcel of Krishna and of the same nature as Krishna also. On the other hand, if we remain attached to materialistic culture, then that will be an obstacle to our developing Krishna consciousness. If we think that, uh, you know, I like everything about Krishna consciousness, but I like techno rock music also. So I'll, I'll just keep this little attachment. So we can add the chanting of Hare Krishna to techno rock music. Do you know that? Do they know what that is? Do you just say rock music? That is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we can add the chanting of Hare Krishna to heavy rock music. So that is better than singing some tune, something like, I want to rip your stomach to pieces or something like that. <laughs> I want to rip your stomach to pieces. <laughs> But it's not Krishna's favorite style of music. And actually that kind of music is produced from the lower modes of material nature, from the mode of, uh, the modes of ignorance and passion mixed. So sometimes we introduce things like that, that you can have some rock band chanting Hare Krishna. So that may be helpful for people who are very much attached to that very uh, low kind of culture to help them to somehow or other start to chant Hare Krishna. Of course, sometimes we find that it's the devotees themselves who attach that kind of music. So, like that, there may be various um, cultural adjustments we can make to help people who are not accustomed to this Vedic culture. Compromise and adjust in English, I'm not... There's, this, there's some difference. I don't know in Russian. Somewhat different. In the uh, you don't know that word? I know the word, I literally. Mm-hmm. Um, it just means to make some amendments. But if we, re- if we ourselves remain attached to these, uh, this culture which is coming from the modes of material nature, then we ourselves will have to remain within the modes of material nature. So, um, we want to develop that culture which is the culture of the soul, which is beyond the modes of material nature. That means learning how to live, act and think in a manner that is conducive for being Krishna conscious. To live, act, think and speak in a manner that is pleasing to Krishna. Often we think, well, this is Indian culture or Hindu culture. Well, in a sense, that's true. I mean, wearing dhoti and sari, that's, we find that in India, we don't find that in uh, traditionally, we don't find that in other parts of the world. But it's not exactly Indian culture, just like we'll say Russian culture, Japanese culture, Chinese culture, American culture, Indian culture. This culture, it's, it has its own singularity. The singularity of this culture is that it is based on that culture of the spiritual world. And other cultures um, have evolved from... Uh, various mental speculations within the three modes of material nature. And uh, Indian culture, that is based on Varnashram culture. This uh, Varnashram system is a system given by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Chatur Varnyam Maya Srishtam Guna Karma Vibhaga Shaha. Krishna says that these four divisions of Varnas or occupational duties, they are created by me according to the uh, qualities and work of the various constituents of this civilized of, civil, of society. Now, we'll find within Vaishnava literature a we'll, we'll often find a rejection of Varnashram Dharma. For instance, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Sarvadhaman Paritaja Mame Kamsha giving up all other varieties of Dharma, simply surrender to me, take shelter in me. So, on, on the other hand, we find other verses. In Bhagavad Gita itself, Krishna says twice, 
Shayan Swadharma Vigana Paradhano Bhayanaha that one should perform one's own duty and not try to do another's duty, one's own dharma. And in the Vedic literature and Vishnu Purana we also find Panasha Macharabata Purushena Parah Puman Vishnur Aradhite Panta Nanya Tato Shaparanam that by worshipping the Lord according to the Vanash within the Vanashram system, working according to the Vanashram system. By, by, by worshipping Vishnu, everyone can uh, achieve the perfection of life. And actually, for the common man, there is no other way to do so. Actually, this is the first proposition that Ramananda Rai said to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu asked him, what is the goal of life and how to attain it? And so Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he rejected this proposition. Eho bhajja, age kahoa. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, this is external, speak somewhat. Uh, this appears to be... Uh, dichotomy or par- paradox. That in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is, says that I made this Vanashram system. And then again, Krishna as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu rejects. This is external. You know, how is this to be understood? How is it to be understood that Srila Prabhupada, who came to teach the highest truth of giving up this material world and going to Krishna, he also very much stressed that we should establish Vanashram. Well, the fact is that Pure devotional service to Krishna is the essence of life. And even following Varnashram, that in itself does not constitute pure devotional service. In fact, it's even possible to follow Varnashram and be a complete demon. Just like we find uh, Jarasandha in, in Krishna Leela, at the time of Krishna Leela, Jarasandha was in many ways, uh, he was a very strict follower of the Vedic Karmakanda system. But he was a demon because he was against Krishna. So, does this mean that Varnashram is completely useless? No, it's very important. Because it's meant to help persons who are not on the platform of pure devotional service come to that platform. It may, that position, uh, maybe, or that system may be misused. Anything can be misused. Even we see the position of guru is meant to help people to come to Krishna consciousness. Even that can be misused. But if someone misuses the position of guru, that doesn't mean that, well, there should be no more gurus. The the system of having gurus is useless. So in the same way, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu uh, told Ramananda Rai that Varnashram is external, uh, that's true because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wanted to hear about the highest perfection of life. Uh, But that doesn't mean that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wanted to do away with the Varnashram system and have total anarchy. So the Varnashram system is, it gives a very structured society. Just as I was saying yesterday in the 20th century, the two uh, predominating socio-political economic theories were capitalism and communism. Uh, Varnashram is a, a different approach altogether. In uh, communism, theoretically, everyone's supposed to be equal. And in capitalism, theoretically, everyone's supposed to have equal opportunity. But Varnashram, in the Varnashram system, everyone is considered equal spiritually, but differences, in other words, inequality on the material platform, are accepted. The Varnashram system very uh, in- intelligently and pragmatically recognizes that there are differences between people. Different people have uh, different inclinations. Different people have different abilities, different people have different levels of intelligence and physical strength. And uh, there's also a marked difference in the human race between males and females, both in physically and psychologically. So instead of trying to say that everything's all one in a kind of impersonalistic way, Krishna has given the Varnashram system recognizing the differences and giving, so slowly, and giving different duties for different people uh, and different training to different people according to their, uh, on one side is gender and on the other side there is one's uh, varna or his, his mm, uh, occupation and duty is the simple case. So uh, this defines one's social position and, and social role, that uh, different people have different roles according to their varna. And within that social role, uh, everyone should worship Krishna. That gives the spiritual equality. Uh, So, um, we were talking about Indian culture and Hindu culture. So, 
how that is uh, unique because that is originally based on Varnashram culture. And Varnashram culture is based on the culture of the spiritual world, but with some adjustment for the, for the people who are attached to this material world. So Krishna consciousness is beyond Varnashram in the sense that it's beyond the uh, simply the rules and rituals which are supposed to bring us to Krishna consciousness because Krishna consciousness is itself Krishna consciousness. But at the same time there are many elements of Varnashram culture which are totally synonymous with those of the essential Vedic culture which is Krishna consciousness. For instance, uh, within the Varnashram system most people are Karmis, they are followers of Karmakanda, otherwise known as Smartas. Of course, Vedic, Karmakanda and Smarta, there are... Anyway, it's more or less the same attitude. Anyway, no more about that. It's too much. So, um, so uh, Karmis, they rise early in the morning. If, they follow, if they're strictly following their Varnashram principles. And devotees do also. And in traditional Varnashram system, the way that devotees dress and the way that karmis dress, it will be the same. It will be the, the traditional, what we call Indian clothes. And even the basic social dealings and interactions, how juniors will respect elders and how the family structure is set up. You'll find it's, it's the same basic culture for Vaishnavas and karmis. Of course, by karmi here I'm referring to uh, Indian people within the Varnashram system who are not specifically devote Vaishnavas. So the same basic culture is there. That's why even though our devotees philosophically we're very much opposed to to uh, many things which Mayavadis say, on the other hand we have many things in common with them also. In many ways as devotees of Krishna we have more in common with the Mayavadis of India than with the Christians of Russia because the, uh, it's the same culture. We, we're coming from the same cultural background. For instance, one very important principle of Vedic culture is cow protection, so that we should not slaughter and eat cows. But we'll find uh, Christians in, in Russia or anywhere else, they, you know, they, they pray to God and they eat God's favorite animal, which he doesn't like. Uh, but we'll find that Mayavadis, even though we're philosophically so much opposed to them, they won't do that. They'll, they'll also, many of them will die for the sake of the cow, and they'll, they'll struggle for, to establish cow protection. So, um, although modern India is not exactly, it, it's quite a long way from the original Varnashram culture. I mean, the, uh, there are so many bogus philosophies that have been propagated. Modern India has become very much influenced by the Western culture to its to our great Shangri. Just like uh, when I first went to India in, in I was mid seventies, then there are many. I mean, most most of India, you can hardly see anyone wearing pants, and be all, everyone, all the men would be wearing dhotis. That it, say if you're in a big crowded city in the, be in the marketplace there'd be so many men walking around and they'd all be wearing dhotis or this in South India they wear this vesti or veti this kind of half dhoti dhoti laptop so in those days like in hundreds of men you'd see maybe one or two wearing this carmi pants but if you go to the same town now, you'll find everyone, in, all the men in pants and hardly anyone wearing the dhoti. So in many ways, the uh, Indian culture is breaking, broken down and bro- breaking down more and more. You can say. But at the same time, uh, there are many things that we have to learn from that and adopt from that. Uh, when we go to India, we should be intelligent enough to distinguish between what is genuine culture and what isn't. And even in Indian culture, even in genuine Indian culture, we should know that which is suitable for Vaishnavas and that which isn't. For instance, we'll find that uh, in North India, actually in various parts of India, it's quite acceptable for men 
to bathe uh, in the river only wearing a topim. And still in South India you'll find men, physical laborers, they're doing work and they only have a copin they're wearing. That's acceptable. But that's not acceptable in this country. We shouldn't adopt that. Uh, again, bathing, you'll find that the uh, people bathe in the rivers, especially they like to bathe in the sacred rivers on special days. But you'll find the men and women, they bathe at a distance from each other. Not that they're all mixed up. So that's something we could adopt. That's something favorable for our Krishna consciousness. For instance, instead of all men and women all sitting together, all, it could be that they were on different sides. Actually, up until a few years ago in India, when they had any like this religious meeting, the women would not even be seen. They'd be behind a screen. And Bhaktisthan Sahasar Thakur used to give initiation to his female disciples from behind a screen. He wouldn't even see them. That was a normal thing. Not just him, but that was normal. When the women would come to see the doctor, he would feel their pulse from behind a screen with a, with a cotton thread attached. So he wouldn't see them. He'd just feel the cotton thread through their pulse like that. Hmm. Touch the cotton thread. Yeah, 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 yeah. One time they wanted to test one Ayurvedic doctor to see if he was really knew what he was doing. So behind the screen they put one pregnant buffalo, female buffalo, and, it, and attached the thread and said, what is the condition? So they said, well, she'll give birth soon. She's feeling hungry. You should give her some grass. <laughs> anyway, the point, the point is that uh, actually one of the major points of Vedic culture, not, all the, or not only Vaishnavas follow, but all follows the Vedic culture. It's this there's separation between the sexes. In one purport, Prabhupada writes that the whole Varnashram system is to uh, help us to overcome the sex desire. Whereas the modern age, they think that this is all foolishness. That you know, everyone should just mix up, be friends. But uh, in that original culture, it was very strictly controlled because the uh, this Maitunagara, this material world, it's the bondage of sex design. So there were so many uh, strict controls to help everyone advance in Krishna consciousness, or to help to everyone to advance to the platform of spiritual consciousness without being degraded by this very powerful sex design. Now in the modern age, we're about as far away from this concept as could possibly be imagined. But actually, modern society is in so many problems. They... Uh, Practically modern society that's based on Darwin and Freud, their theories. Indirectly, but not very indirectly, the whole of modern civilization is based on their misconceptions. Darwin, of course, the, the, the result of his theory is that people think that life is a result of matter. Now, if we think that life is a product of matter, and that when the body is finished, everything is finished, quote, unquote, Professor Kotowski, then uh, then there's no need for any spiritual life. There's no need for any morals. Simply uh, eat, drink, sleep, be merry and enjoy, for tomorrow we shall all be dead. The Darwin theory leads to animal life. Even if we accept the theory of evolution, then we should evolve to a higher level of consciousness. But the result of the propagation of his theory is that humankind has degraded to lower than the animals. There's a story that the monkeys had a meeting in the jungle. And they were saying that, you know, the humans are teaching that they descended from us and that uh, you know, they're a more advanced form of monkey. So the monkeys were saying, well, this is a great insult to us. You see, we're, we're not as degraded as the, as the human beings. So Darwin's theory, it's evolution in reverse. Actually, we didn't evolved from monkeys, but the result of his theory is that men have become less than monkeys. And Freud had many bizarre ideas. His basic, his basic hypothesis was that all of human behavior is based on uh, sexual motive, which Prabhupada agreed with. He said that's true. In conditioned society, that's true. 
But Freud's approach to it, of course, was very, our understanding of that was very different to the Vedic understanding as given us by Prabhupada. Because Freud, thinking that man is a product of matter, uh, a la Darwin, or a la Darwin, or whatever, he, uh, he thought that all problems, that all psychoses that people have is because of suppression of sexual desire. And da- uh, Freud analyzed that so in, in human society, there are so many sexual taboos. So, of course, there's a very great simplification, but Freud, he recommended that people become free of sexual taboos, and they become free in their sexual behavior, and then they'll be happy. So, uh, Freud has had tremendous uh, influence on... His theories have had tremendous influence on the way people behave in the modern age. And, uh, therefore... In the modern age, where there is very little restriction on sexual on sexual behavior, it's generally considered that whatever you feel like doing sexually, then you should do it. And we find that even uh, homosexuality is fully supported and endorsed in the, in Western Europe and America. So much so that even if you say anything against homosexuality in many states of America, it's actually a legal offense to do so. Because the idea is that, well, if you, you know, if you want to do it, then you feel like that, then you shouldn't suppress it. You should do it. And the same thing that, you know, you get married and then, well, after some time you don't like your wife and your, and your children, then you just leave them. That's all. Get another one. Find another one. There's plenty of women in the world. So this is absolutely antithetical to Vedic culture. This uh, modern way of life is based on these um, absolutely materialistic theories in which the underlying uh, pulse is one of enjoy yourself. Whereas in Vedic culture, the underlying pulse or underlying principle is that we should act for Krishna's pleasure. Varnashram begins with following the rules and regulations of Vedic life. That is the beginning stage of karma kanda. So that in that stage, one is not directly acting for the pleasure of Krishna, but at least he comes within the rules and regulations of Varnashram life and learns to accept their author- the authority of the Vedas. So gradually one has to learn, uh, as one advances in the Varnashram system, one begins to act uh, without personal desire, act just as a sense of duty without any personal desire. So it's a gradual system of purification, whereas in modern uh, or materialistic life there's no question of any purification. There's no concept or even of purification. There's no differentiation between uh, proper and imp- improper action, between pious life and sinful life. Just like um, even a short time ago in, in Russia, it would have been... Con- even though there was the, the state dogma was atheism, practically... But it was still considered there's something wrong. It's not proper if young boys and girls, before marriage, they have sex. Is that correct? Mm. Would you say that's a correct statement? No. Okay. So, okay. so even though the, uh, the Christianity was being suppressed, but still that had survived within the Russian culture, that which came from Christianity. There was a, a feeling that something is right and something is wrong. This is to... To sex before marriage that is sinful. There was some idea like that. But in modern society, there's no concept of sin. People have no fear of committing sinful activities. They think that, well, whatever you want to do, that's good. And even parents, they encourage their children, you know, go have boyfriend, girlfriend, get pregnant, this, that, and the other. One of my uh, disciples in Ireland, she's a young lady, well, she's almost 30 now. Now, Ireland, you see, even in the time when I was a young man there, I was uh, like just in my teens, and this uh, sex outside marriage was, it was just, it just didn't happen. It was, I mean, it was very much still at that time taboo. She told me that, this was like six, seven years ago, she told me, she's only what... Uh, you know, she's less than 20 years older than me, but she told me that on the street she lived, in every house, every girl except her had a baby before marriage. 
Well, she told me that this is she's just one generation later than me. Mm. No, when was it? This no. Was, yeah, this was six years ago. She told me. No. But in every in every every girl on the street except mm. her had had a child before marriage. So we can say that in terms of sexual behavior, Irish culture underwent underwent a major change within one generation. And of course, that's all over the world. Because the whole world is becoming influenced by this modern Hollywood culture, which is actually a very demoniac culture, being based on these wrong theories of Darwin, Freud and others. And although it may look very nice, you'll see, uh, isn't it nice, you see young boy, young girl, and on the movies it looks very nice. But it actually leads to so much suffering. Uh, in Moscow on Janmashtami, I was sitting outside the temple in the evening, and a group of young German girls came and they spoke to me. So I was telling them about the basic principles of Christian consciousness. So uh, when I said that there should be no sex only within marriage, then one girl, she asked why. And by the way she asked, it appeared to me that the, such an idea, had, she never even thought of such a thing. It was a completely new idea to her. So we can understand that this uh, modern culture and modern way of life, it is most uh, damaging to spiritual life. So when we're talking about adopting Vaishnav culture, we're talking about different modes of behavior. And we're talking about not only different modes of behavior, but a completely different approach to life. Now, quite often we see that devotees, they take up Krishna consciousness and they take up Krishna conscious culture to some extent. But at the same time, they retain very much their old cultural way of thinking. So we are asking that you should have a complete revamp of the consciousness. That we have to adopt the culture of Krishna consciousness in such a way that we can become fully Krishna conscious. A whole approach to life our moral values, uh, everything. And under, understanding that um, the Western or, or the non-Vedic way of life that is simply entangling us in this material world. And that the uh, Vedic culture, if practiced for the sake of becoming Krishna conscious, is a very great help in our doing so, in, in our becoming Krishna conscious. So... Again, this uh, what, what we call traditional Indian culture, as much as we can adopt that uh, within our present situation, that will be helpful for us to become Krishna conscious, if Krishna is kept very clearly in the center. So there are many practical details of this, both in uh, the manner of conduct of social dealings and our personal behavior. Like I said, I've given some idea of that in this book, Glimpses of Traditional Indian Life. And I've actually written a very much bigger book, which gives all the details of how to do all these things, what should be done and what shouldn't. Uh, you have written. Well, I've written it in 90%. I mean, oh. All the things, it, it's all there, but it just has to be organized a oh. bit more. With all the details, which are important. The things, I mean, just like for instance, you should give something to someone or receive it with your right hand, not with your left. Because to do so with your left is insulting. Oh, well, that's just one of many details. Okay. You may think, well, what does it matter? You know, what is it, you know, Right hand or left hand. But uh, all our acharyas followed this. Prabhupada taught his disciples to do that. Because the right hand is meant for uh, auspicious and clean things, like eating food. And the left, hand, the left hand is used for things like uh, washing your backside off the stool. So that's one detail, and there are many details. And we should learn these so as to satisfy Krishna better so as to live as a cultured and civilized devotee the way Krishna wants us to live. And if we actually want to be Krishna conscious, then we should know how Krishna lives and live like that. There are actually very many details. We'll find one uh, in, in Vedic culture, purity and contamination. It's a very, uh, very important part of Vedic culture. Just like, for instance, people wonder, why is it that women, traditionally, they don't do deity worship in temples? Well, there are various reasons for that. One reason is that the dharma of their body, or the, here we're saying that the dharma means the intrinsic activity of the body, is to have children. 
So nowadays we have contraceptives and all these kind of things, but traditionally women have lots of children and they have to look after them. Now that's, uh, you know, that, that children require their mother's attention. In the modern age, the women, they have children and they go off to work, but traditionally they look after their children. So one reason they're not supposed to be a pujari in a public temple is because they're supposed to be looking after their children. Another reason is because children are unclean. They're always passing stool here and there, dribbling, and putting their hands in their mouths. Mm-hmm. And women have to clean them and look after them. So in this way, uh, because of their dharma of looking, after women, uh, of looking after children, then women are not clean enough to uh, look after the deity. Now, they may do deity worship at home, and then there'll be many women, and then the older women will feel help with the deity worship. In, in the public temple where there's to be a very high standard, then only the male Brahmins should do. And we, the Brahmins, they would not touch those castes who are considered untouchable. Because people like lechers and chandalas, they eat meat, and they don't follow principles of cleanliness. So therefore a Brahmana shouldn't touch them because by touching them he'll become unclean. That's where this concept of untouchability came up. Now we all, we all come from the background of untouchables. But by taking Vaishnava initiation we can become Brahmin and thus qualified to worship the deity. But that we should know what the principles of cleanliness are. Otherwise if we violate those principles then we're not actually Brahmanas. And we're not actually fit to worship the deity. We'll make offenses instead of properly worshiping the deity. So we should learn these basic things which uh, children in traditional Indian families learn from about the age of one. Literally, before they can speak, they're being, trained, they're being trained in these cultural points. Just like you'll see young babies, one year old, they like to put their hand in their mouth. Is it true? All the mothers know. Oh, God, 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 God. They put their hand in their mouth, isn't it? So, you'll find in traditional families that the mother, even before the baby can speak, every time the baby puts the hand in her, takes it out. Before he can put his hand in his mouth. Which means about seven or eight times a minute. And this way, in this way, before they, they can even speak, they learn, don't put your hand in your mouth. We don't know. We don't know. So we come to read the Bhagavad Gita and we lick our tongue and (laughs) move the page. So all these things are to be learned. All right, I'm going to finish there. My time's up. Um, I'd like to distribute some prasadam to all the wonderful devotees, which is also an important part of our.